Hello, everyone, or salutare. Uh, I'm very excited and, and honored to be here in front of what I would call the home crowd. I think of it like uh, the Champions League final, your team playing in the home ground. It feels a bit like that, and you'll get the sports pun a bit later. Um, thanks for the organizers to put this, this great conference. Uh, I didn't realize it was the first edition. Uh, happening here in Bucharest, Fox Days Front End. So it's even a greater honor being here for the first edition. Um, and before we get started, just let me get some kind of the room temperature here about the topic. Like how many of you have heard of GraphQL? Pretty much everyone. How many of you have used GraphQL? About a third. And I guess out of those third, how many of you have used Relay of, or Apollo Client? That's like a third of the third, so just like less than a handful of people, which is great, or not. We'll see about that. Um, and of course, slides. They don't like moving around. Here you go. So first off, who am I? My name is Mihai, and I'm even more excited that this is for once a conference where people can read my last name and pronounce it correctly. That's very exciting. I'm an engineering manager at Huddle. Uh, I work from Germany. And if you have a favorite sports team that might or might not come from Romania, they use Huddle to improve themselves. And you might, it might not even be a team. I'm pretty sure everyone here knows Simona Halep. Uh, the previous coach, Darren Cahill, is one of our products. That's how Simona Hall got world number one, FYI. Um, and these are some stats. Like, it's, call it a niche market. You might have not heard of it unless you work in sports. But a lot of people use it. And it's kind of, of a, let me think of a productivity tool that everyone uses. Maybe Google Docs, everyone uses Google Docs at work something like that for sports teams to improve their game, to review their performance, to get better from one game to the other. About this talk, I will be touching on three points. Let me move that pointer because it's annoying. There we go, three points. One of each, the core. I will split it another three points just because I like the magic number three. And we'll touch on GraphQL, brief history, uh, the kind of story of how we are using GraphQL at Huddle, and uh, how we transitioned, how we started using Relay, as that was one of the first GraphQL clients out there, and how we transitioned to Apollo, what are some of the pro pros and cons of, of each, and we'll finish off with tips and tricks. As a disclaimer, before we get started, I will not get too much into detail in GraphQL, and that's great because it seemed like everyone knows what that is. Nor I will teach you how to set up Relay or Apollo as there's very thorough API docs on the web. Uh, but I will highlight the differences between the two, the pros and cons, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a good idea of what fits best for your project or whatever you're doing at work with GraphQL or sparks new ideas of things you can do with GraphQL. And there's a slight bias on React here, so bear with me with that. Let's start off with how, how GraphQL came into existence. Like some of the motivations behind it, how it grew over the years, and it all started around 2011, Facebook, I'm not sure how many of you used Facebook back then, and if you did, especially on a mobile phone, you might recall it looks a bit like this. You might also recall the pain of using Facebook on mobile. It would continue to, to crash. It would be very slow, very annoying. Um, and that's because it was literally a wrapper around uh, a, web, um, a web browser, a mobile web browser. Uh, so they had a customized version of the web browser, depending on the user agent, they would serve certain assets. And that was great in terms of reusability, in terms of maybe scalability of the Facebook platform. 
but as the web applications were getting more complex, and even back then Facebook was about lots of pictures, video was coming quite strongly, animations, like all that snappiness that you got used to on the web, it wasn't that great on mobile. Devices back then were not that powerful, and let's just say it was a pain. And you might recall, not long after they, they did this, they went on this uh, web-based native layer for the Facebook app. Uh, we had Mark there at TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco, giving his probably one of the most uh, infamous quotes, like biggest mistake was betting too much on HTML5. That was a big blow for the web. That was like a lot of people were like, what are you doing? This is crazy. It's like your product is mainly a web PHP application with MySQL, which probably for those of you that did web back then, that was a staple. And Mark made the point that with mobile picking up, so 2012, the iPhone was around for about five years, more and more people getting iPhones, Android was picking up. Google and Apple were investing a lot in the platform SDKs because that was a source of revenue for them. It made sense for them to improve the SDKs, make more things possible for native rather than invest in improving their, their mobile browsers. So at that point, Facebook started slowly getting, uh, rewriting their mobile applications and building these new set of technologies that they publicly announced in 2015, piggybacking on the popularity of React, like React, I think it was 2013. Uh, in 2015, it was quite popular at the React Conf in California. They had a talk where they introduced the world to GraphQL, like what they were using since around 2012 as a way to minimize the, the round trips on the network to get the resources they need, um, avoiding these multiple route trips like in a very efficient way. And yeah, pretty much React focused. Although GraphQL was more than that. Later that year, again, another React conference around this part of the world, they, they touched on they released a working draft for the GraphQL spec uh, reference implementation in JavaScript, as well as introducing Relay. The title of that talk was an application for framework for React. So literally they tried to get to market based on their most popular product, React. Although the two, maybe Relay not that much, but GraphQL was like a completely different story, like it was so much potential to it. The way it was defined at that point, this definition is pretty much uh, the same these days, a data querying language uh, designed to kind of describe complex data dependencies of applications. So GraphQL is not necessarily a package you install for NPM as a dependency, it's more like a mindset, like how you structure your um, your data dependencies and how the means you would fetch that data and change that data. Think of it like REST in a very clever way. Relay, very much tied to React. Data fetching functionality for React, uh, making it easier for people that were building React applications to use GraphQL and adopt GraphQL. And it was building on top of the flux pattern. Uh, you might have seen this in the past. Uh, again, very React standard design pattern. We have components that trigger actions, actions which trigger changes. In this case, a component would get its data through a query, uh, the term for that. The data would go into a store, and that store would pass the updates to the component, and if they want to change the data, it would go 
to the server, do a GraphQL write in this case, and also optimistically update the store so that you can see the changes reflected on the component. Not long after that, in 2016, Apollo put one of their most popular libraries, if not the most popular libraries, and this is a hidden gem of, uh, from the history of Apollo client. Uh, if you didn't know, it was called Redux GraphQL. And uh, yeah, that's the beauty of open source. You can go to the first commit or very first commits and see what happened around there. And it was literally described as a client built on top of Redux. Redux was very popular back then. So Redux is an implementation of the flux pattern. Um, very lightweight, very simple. And it's more or less the norm. These days is a bit different as there are a lot of other options. But it, I think for the past, like 2016, 2017 or so, everyone was talking about Redux. Fast forward to 2019. Let's see what we have in 2019. It's the year that a roaster is running around the galaxy uh, that was put into space by reusable rockets that returned to Earth in very synchronized fashion. And I'll leave you to the slide for a few seconds because it's like just the most mesmerizing thing ever. Um, and it's also the year that the last season of Game of Thrones came out. And uh, let's just say not everyone was excited about it. But without getting too carried away with this, and controversial to that matter, uh, going back to the focus of this talk, it's, um, it's also the year that GraphQL is more or less the norm in terms of defining APIs. This is the NPM package for the JavaScript reference implementation. And as you can see, per week, it has more people interested in it than people signing that petition to redo season eight of Game of Thrones. So a lot of people watch Game of Thrones, so I assume yeah, that means it's a good signal there. Um, it has a few conferences dedicated to it. It has a vibrant community. Uh, and as we've seen, everyone heard of it, even though they might have not gotten the chance to use it. The big players in the front-end client space, Relay, Apollo, uh, Relay Modern, as it's called, uh, and Apollo Client version 2, quite different from their inception. Uh, Relay Modern is simpler and more predictable. It's lightweight. Apollo Client is no longer based on Redux. It's more customizable, flexible, and I highlighted these points because these play a key part in, in the story that I'm going to tell you at the core of this talk. So, <clears throat> Graf <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> ah, GraphQL at Huddle. So we started using GraphQL in the early days, I think it was early 2016 when we were looking, we're building this product, um, the huddle messaging sign, so think of it like Facebook Messenger, where that would allow athletes and coaches and basically the team to communicate with each other, like being very deeply integrated with huddle, like you could share video analysis and schedule and attachments and all the things. And we wanted to build this product um, to build like a library for it, to be platform agnostic, to minimize round trips, to get messages, send messages, all the things, and to be flexible. <clears throat> and GraphQL like ticked all those boxes. So we build it on top of GraphQL. The backend support for that, uh, which I won't get into details, as this is a front-end conference. And we wanted it to be lightweight, right? At that point, I think Relay was the de facto GraphQL client on web, and Apollo maybe, it was just came around, it wasn't that big at that point. And we think like, let's just understand like how can you use GraphQL on the client? Like, what does it actually do?
So it's quite simple. You need a way to query to get the data or to change the data mutations. And what the client does under the hood is just do a post request with the query and uh, data variables, like what you're changing and so on. So we went ahead and, uh, ahead and built it. <coughs> so this is a pretty much a bare bones DIY GraphQL client where you have a simple wrapper uh, for AJAX requests, you post to the endpoint, you include the, as a data parameter the query, the variables, you get the response, you do whatever you want with the response. Very simple, very few lines of code. Lightweight, no dependencies, dependencies no security risks, um, and flexible. Like with a few more lines of code, you can add caching to it, local storage based caching. That's great. This worked very well. So well that it's still being used now in production almost three years later with slight variations, but pretty much the same. And with that proof of concept, you could call it, you realize that there's a huge potential. We can do lots of things and it simplifies lots of things and it's easy to understand the data because you structure everything like a graph. So we started putting it in all the places these are some of the microservices we have. Uh, the messaging is the one you saw. Libraries, the content management side, which we'll go a bit more into details a few slides later. Clips, getting information about video analysis, the clips that are created there, teams. We had, and these days we're also kind of aggregating all in one endpoint, a gateway, GraphQL gateway. Uh, basically the endpoint to rule them all so that you can point your client to that gateway and basically get any type of information for queries that your app needs or whatever feature your building needs. And then we got to the first maybe complex web application that was backed by GraphQL. So we needed more than just querying data and sending mutations. We needed some um, optimistic updates, caching, and a few more other complex things. With the data needs were, were different. And Relay was, this is also like 2016, after we did messaging. And Relay was kind of the de facto client for GraphQL. We started playing around with it. And I'm going to show you conceptually how that worked and how these clients at a high level work. So Relay provides these wrappers, a container. You wrap your React component with it. The container um, defines the data requirements of the component. And what Relay does behind the hood, it, it does all the requests to your endpoint, the generates the query, gets all that data and passes the data as props to your component. And this is yeah, pretty much what I said earlier, how you would define that. You define the query as a fragment. Again, these are like very GraphQL uh, related terms. Uh, you can find all the docs possible on, online if you do a quick Google and some boilerplate how you would integrate this in your app. You have a, a router and React router in this place. You would apply some middleware that came from Relay and some environment and the queries. It's, it takes a bit of setting up, but once it's in place, you could write all your components that have data needs as a container with the data need collocated on that component so you know exactly there's is very small chances of regressions of maybe a component not having the required fields. And this this was relay classic. Some of the pros it, it provided good encapsulation. 
had well-defined patterns, really very opinionated on how you should have your um, GraphQL schema for pagination purposes, yeah. Edges and nodes. It was what Facebook was using for a while now, a few years. And honestly, there wasn't an alternative at that point. But it was complex, complex API. Especially doing mutations was were ridiculous. Black box, you couldn't do anything about the relay store. So where the data that came from the server was being held, you couldn't integrate it with other state management tools like Redux, and persisting the cache was a pain. Right? Relay did its own cache. And most of the time working with it was literally like this. There was a lot of trial and error. Documentation was sparse. And I see why Apollo picked up at that point. Relay Modern, the latest version of Relay, tackled some of those pain points, but I think they, they kind of lost the train it with, they lost the, the support with Relay Classic. Um, and yeah, some points on Relay Modern, simpler, lighter, uh, but it was also elaborate to migrate if you had already a Relay uh, implementation, and it took a long time. You know, I've been talking with some of the core people that were working on GraphQL going to these React conferences, and they were like, yeah, our internal implementation is very tied in with, it's way ahead, but tied in with Facebook internal, so they couldn't justify spending time open sourcing it. It was a bit of a mess. They put it out there in the end, but it was a bit too late because Apollo came around. And this is me migrating from Relay to Apollo, and you can see some of the key wins that we had at that point. Like smaller bundle, the app was faster. Um, we had resilience to errors because of the way Relay was handling GraphQL errors. Debugging was easier. At that point, Apollo was based on Redux. We were using Redux. And so we could integrate everything for Apollo. It was a big day, let's just put it that way. Uh, quite a few lines changed there. Um, yeah, documentation was great. I think that's the thing they did very well from the beginning, lightweight. Um, and one drawback you might think is like too much flexibility. They didn't have any patterns, it wasn't opinionated, and they weren't recommending necessarily any particular way of doing things. Uh, so to some extent it helped that we were on Relay before because that was very strict about how you structure things, especially the collocation of data requirements with components. With Apollo, you, you didn't you were not obliged to do that. You could have put all your queries in one part of the app and all your components in the other and just link them together. Um, and it worked very similar. You have a container. You can define the, the queries for it. You can collocate it or not. We decided to collocate it. And in terms of boiler boilerplate, you also have a provider that took the GraphQL client. And with the Apollo version one, the provider was also the Redux provider. So if you were using Redux, you didn't need to rub the whole app in a Redux provider. You could just use the Apollo one. And these are some stats in terms of how much faster it was, bundle sizes. These, these were the versions that we moved from. You can see it's literally half the size, the minified gzip version, uh, which was great. Um, again, putting them side by side, you had complex APIs, black box, spotty documentation versus lightweight, good integration, straightforward. There was a bit more boilerplate just to put everything in the nice structure that Relay provided, but it was very well maintainable at that point. Fast forward. Uh, this is latest stats, latest Relay, latest Apollo. Uh, for Relay, at least, I couldn't get the download stats from NPM. 
uh, sooner than January. But I guess looking at the numbers, you kind of get the point. Um, and this is like a key area. When you're, you're looking at tools to use in your applications, open source tools, use, usage is very important. Usage is basically a signal of the health of that package. It's a guarantee that it's gonna have a long life. It's a guarantee that a lot of people are invested. People will maintain it. And this paints the picture of where the difference between the two. And when I started doing this talk, I was planning to kind of dive a bit deeper in the, the newer versions. Their APIs are largely the same, but I realized, oh, it's probably on one end gonna take me the rest of the afternoon reading for API docs. And as no one likes that, I wouldn't wanna put you asleep or keep you longer from the coffee break. Because um, at the end of the day, it's important to know not the details on how to integrate them or how to use them, because you can easily find that. There's lots of, as I said, tutorials. But what are the benefits and drawbacks of each? Uh, and the principles that they had behind them. Right. And that brings us to the lessons we learned, like some tips and tricks when you're looking to implement uh, GraphQL in your web application. First of all, you have to be pragmatic. Like use what makes sense for your project. I show you the example where we went with a bare bones DIY GraphQL client because we didn't need anything complex. We wanted to build something lightweight. I'll also show you the example with the library where it was a large complex application uh, in which scenario we did go with one of these popular open source libraries that had support for lots of things. Made it easier for lots of developers to work on. Uh, but at the same time, it also showed you that you shouldn't get too attached to one library. You need to reevaluate. Is that still a library that's well maintained? Does it have good documentation? Is the ramp up fast enough? Like people moving from other parts of the company working with that. Do they understand it? That wasn't the case with Relay. That's where we made a very good point to switch to this like very popular lightweight client that would not only bring product benefits, which made a discussion very easy with product owners and product managers, but also improve the developer experience. And lastly, you should expect breaking changes. Like you saw, I emphasized on the fact that Apollo was, early Apollo was based on Redux. We were using Redux. We didn't need to have two separate state management layers, one for the data side and one for, well, we were duplicating the data in Redux, one for caching purposes, uh, or application state-wise. You could use only one. But then Apollo version two decided that, well, we don't need Redux, we can build our own. And then these days they're like, why use any other state management? You can hold your whole state in Apollo. Um, so be prepared for that. Things are likely gonna break in a very bad way. We honestly did not upgrade to version two on, no, we did, but we used the plugin to still keep Redux because our state structure in Redux was so complex that it wasn't worth rewriting it to be directly in, uh, in a poll. And that basically brings us to maybe one of the most important thing in software engineering in general, uh, that I think if it's one thing you live from th this talk with, it should be this one. How many of you know what this means? Very few, very few it's a very kind of English software engineering jargon, YAGNI. So that's you ain't gonna need it. You might have heard variations where people are in all fairness asking like, why, why are we doing this? Why are we adding 
two dozen dependencies to do an API call. Uh, why should we complicate our life, right? Basically says, and this is a real thing, it's uh, defined in, well, it was coined in that um, book about extreme programming and agile methods. You should not add functionality until it's deemed necessary. And you have that meme as well with a very elaborate bridge over a very small stream that probably is going to go dry by the time you need it. So don't complicate your life. Don't spend a few months building something that you're never going to use. And on that note, thank you very much. <laughs>